The following message is from King's Cross Church in Manchester, New Hampshire. For more information, please visit us at kingscrossmanchester.com. We're going to turn to our Bibles in John 17, and we are going to be looking at the last of our current series, which is the five solas of the Reformation, and this one, the last one, is Soli Deo Gloria. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, we've got Bibles in the back. Um, they're free. Um, and you can take those because I've got a Bible. Um, I don't need those. Um, anyhow, so uh, looking at John 17, and I'm going to pray first, and then we're going to get looking at this together. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you that Jesus loves your glory and that you have saved us to know and feel and enjoy your glory. And so, Father, as we look at your word Tonight, we ask that you would change us by your word and the power of the Spirit to love you and to enjoy your glory. Lord, help us because we are weak and our minds wander and I need your help. So Father, would you send us your spirit now? Give us your spirit with eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts inflamed to respond. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we have been looking at uh, the five souls of the Reformation. Um, the Reformation happened five years or five hundred years ago. Um, five hundred years and what, like twelve days or something like that. It happened when Martin Luther nailed the ninety-five theses on the door, and of course, he didn't intend to start um, an international uh, upheaval. But out of that came the recovery of the gospel. The church had begun to stray and had begun to diminish the place of Jesus and the place of the Bible and the the free grace of the gospel. And those things had begun to get eclipsed. And the part of the Reformation was to reclaim the the glory of God's good news to us in the gospel. And so those five points of the Reformation are Scripture alone is our authority. Um, Christ alone is the one who saves us. We're saved by pure grace, not by works and grace. And we are saved through faith. That's how we receive everything that's in Jesus, and it's all to God's glory alone. Those are the five things of the Reformation. Uh, We use these Latin phrases because it's always cool to speak in Latin, um, but we're just going to use to the glory of God alone as our tagline. And one of the things that comes out of the Reformation is this idea that the glory of God is the chief end of man or the main point of our lives. Um, It kind of becomes a bit of the tagline, right? You know, you have like a company, you have like, what's the tag, like, what's the main point of the company? Well, that's what the tagline does. So if you look at it, can we pull up some slides here? So just do it, right? Nike, like this is their tagline. Like they want you to just put those shoes on and do it. Like that's the main point of Nike shoes. Uh, Apple, of course, the best computers on the planet. Uh, <laughs> think different. They want you to be the, uh, do, you, do you guys remember seeing those ads from the 80s of the think different stuff? Anyhow, they, this is their tagline, right? M&M's, uh, melts in your mouth, not in your hands, right? Everybody just had Halloween. This is, the main ta- this is the main point of M&M's, right? They want you to stick them in your face and eat them and not hold on them too long. Um, of course, Duncan, right? America runs on Duncan. Their tagline captures the idea that your life needs fuel and caffeine, and so what better to do that than high fructose corn syrup and coffee all in one stop. So those are the, those are the taglines of these companies, and so, oh, the Skittles, there we go. Taste the rainbow. Last one. All right, we're done with those. <laughs> so the main point of the Reformation is that the glory of God is the main point of the whole world and of your life. That's, the, that's like this huge statement that comes out of the Reformation because it could easily be uh, the church is the main point of your life or the Bible is the main point of your life or something other than God, Right? But the Reformation, though we want to reclaim the, 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 the authority of God's word and the centrality of grace in the gospel and the glory of Jesus, we want to make sure that it's clear the main point of all of the world and all of our lives is the glory of God. And so that's why we're looking at John 17, because here at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, right before he goes to the cross, we have John 17, which is... Um, this huge prayer of Jesus, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a room where somebody is just like, just like a godly 
person. They pray, and you're just kind of like, I don't think I know how to pray, because like, I don't think I can pr- ever pray like that. You know what I'm talking about? Imagine being in the room when Jesus prays this. This is like the best prayer that's ever been prayed. And so we're going to look at this and see how in the prayer of Jesus, the glory of God is held out as the main point of his life and what he desires for us. So we're going to look, we're going to read through John 17, 1 through 5, and we're going to make a few comments and we'll start looking through this together. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed." A part of the problem of talking about this whole thing of glory is that Jesus uses the word glory five times in this one, this one section. And maybe some of you like me are thinking, but what does glory mean? What does that word even mean? Before we get talking about what is it, how does Jesus pray it, what does glory even mean? I think that a helpful definition for glory is to say that it's, it describes the size, the value, and beauty of God. It says the size of God. So when you think about like the Franconian notch can we pull up this picture so there's a franconian notch it's kind of glorious from like a distance and then this is a this is a picture i took from the top of it when i almost died hiking hiking it three years ago in november but the glory of of god's creation the size of the mountain is just like incredible like you can see it from the from the ground level it's like it's kind of big but the size like you get up on top of you're like oh my gosh you can see forever the world's actually round you know, sorry. <laughs> the size of the world is is in perspective. You can see it. Like it's not just like like uh, it's not something you you can kind of see from a distance, but you get close to it and you see. Wow, the, the size is massive, right? The value. Right, so here's a uh, picture of me and the boys. Right, these boys they know me, and the, the another one that's coming along. Um, if you were to go to them and say. Um, look, uh, your dad's really, really, really buff and strong, but here's another guy who's really, really, really strong and better and smarter. Do you think they'd want to trade me out for that guy? Any second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill, they, <laughs> in a second. No, they because know, they know that of my personal value to them, right? Like I, I personally, I care for them. I know them. They know the value that I am in their lives and they are to me. There's a there's an understanding of, it's not just like, here's a warm body who can be a dad. It's like, no, they know me, right? And then the other thing is this size, value, and beauty. I don't have a picture for this because I, I think it's pretty self-evident of like beautiful music or, um, you know, a beautiful artwork. You know, you, you see a beautiful thing. You see like, wow, that, that's just desirable. Like it's good. Like it's, 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 it's just beautiful, Right? And so when we talk about the glory of God, it's, a, it's, a, it's seeing and desiring the size, the value, and beauty of God. So when we say glory, we're not just saying kind of like shiny lights, right? We mean seeing God for who he is and his size, how incredibly massive in terms of this is how different and huge God is compared to our puny brains, right? We see his value and how desirable he is as just how how good he is to us, and then the, the beauty of God, which is always kind of a strange thing to say, but to say, God, God is desirable. So when we say that, that's what we mean by bl- glory. And so with that in mind, we're going to look now at John 17. We're going to pick back up with these verses. And as we look at this, I think we're going to see that we were designed to enjoy the glory of God. Like that's the main point of what Jesus is praying about for our for God's glory and our engagement with God's glory, because God designed us as men and women, to see God's glory and to desire his glory. Not only to desire it, but to enjoy it. We are made hand in glove to enjoy the glory of God. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up then right back in verse 1, 1 through 5, and we're going to start kind of three dynamics we're going to see about enjoying the glory of God. 
God's glory and your purpose is the first one we're going to look at, verse 1 through 5. So we see here, verse 1, and Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. So here he is, Jesus, at the very beginning of his prayer, he is using, the, he's using glory twice to talk about what's the purpose of his ministry, of his life, and what he desires. And the hour that he's talking about, he says, the hour has come, the hour for God's glory to be seen, that hour is on the cross, right? It's not just like he's not saying, well, it's 7.05 at night, and 7.05 is the hour during the day that God's glory gets seen. Now, the hour that he's talking about, the hour of all the ages is rushing in and slowing down at the cross of Christ, where Christ walks up a dusty hill with a cross on his back and dies in our place. That, when, when the Son of God is hung, suspended between heaven and earth, that's when he is saying, Father, glorify the Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is what he says, this is eternal life, that they may know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Right, so what's the purpose of Jesus? The, Jesus says God's glory is seen in the cross, right, where God, who does not owe us anything, sends his Son to die in our place, So that all that we do owe God, which is punishment, being punished for all of our sins against him for all eternity, Jesus takes that in our place. And what does the cross accomplish? Right, verse three, and this is eternal life, that they would know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You see, the glory of God that's going on in the cross is a divine introduction. It is how we get to know God. It is where we begin our our relationship with God. It is where Jesus introduces us to a loving father. The father that sent him, that is where Jesus introduces us to him, is on the cross. And then picking up in verse four, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You see, the father's love for us and God's love for himself is accomplished on the cross. See, I have accomplished the work that you have given me to do. Jesus wants the Father, he got, Jesus wants God to be glorified for who he is. And so God's holiness, his goodness, his glory is seen when Jesus dies because he has said, I want these people to know you and to enjoy you. But just as Jesus is praying, he's praying about the cross, he's also praying, but here's what I, I, I want them to see your glory in the cross, but I, I want to go, go return to the unhindered glory of the Father's first, you know, Verse five, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Christ has in view the f- returning to the glory of God to his Father in heaven. So you see the size, the size of what's going on, right? The whole of the Bible, uh, all this fat stuff right up here, it's all, it's all pointing towards this one moment. The size of God's redemptive story, where he comes and saves people who are broken and sinful and whacked out like us, it's all realized, it happens at this very moment where Jesus goes and dies in our place. So the size of God's storytelling ability, that's, I mean, it's a crazy story. Have you ever thought about how crazy the Bible is? <laughs> like, it's crazy. That the, I mean, Genesis is just like a bunch of Jerry Springer people that God comes and hangs out with to save and to use to bless the world. Like, that's not the people that I would have chosen. And then he continues to hang out with them and to bless them amidst all of their stupid decisions against him. And he walks them right up to this point where one man is put forward because God himself has taken on flesh and steps out. The size of that story to magnify God, to make God's glory not only seen but felt, because here he's praying for us. Right, the value, right? You begin to feel it, don't you? That Jesus, the great value of, he did not have to do this. You realize he's praying to go back. He's praying to go back to the Father's presence. He didn't, this was, he didn't have to leave. 
but he valued God's glory being seen and felt and enjoyed. So he wanted us to know that value. And then the beauty of it. I mean, can you imagine? Here is the king of the universe living and breathing as a carpenter. And I mean, at the beginning of John, it says, what good comes out of Nazareth, right? It's like he was like from some potunk town in New Hampshire. It's like, what good comes out of New Hampshire? It's like, well, it's the same thing. He was from, he was from nowhere place. He was the king of the universe and he's from a nowhere place and he comes to live our lives and to live in our place. Do you notice this? That Jesus, Jesus' final prayer here is evocative. He wants, he wants the glory of God to be seen. He wants the glory of God to be felt. He wants us to enjoy the glory of God. All right, he, God is glorious and he wants God to be seen and enjoyed. See, this is, I think what's helpful about this is God's glory and your purpose, right? That's what we're talking about. God's glory and your purpose. The main purpose of your life <laughs> is not about you, right? Just to kind of clarify this, like even though uh, our phones would make us believe that we are the most important people on the planet, <laughs> Jesus is praying here, God's glory, seeing him and who he is, that's the main purpose of your life. Your purpose Jesus prays for us to enjoy the glory of God because that's the way we're designed. And we're broken and wrecked by all the sin and junk in our lives. And Jesus says, no, 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 I don't want that sin and junk to define them. So Father, I'm going to die in their place to save them from that so that they could see you and enjoy who you are. That's why, just so you know, that's why we sing a lot of songs about Jesus. <laughs> you know, We sing a lot of songs and we... we explicitly talk about Jesus and we sing about him. So if you ever wonder like, why, why are we singing all these songs? They're really wordy songs. They talk a lot about Jesus. We talk a lot about Jesus because that's what Jesus is praying. God, they're going to see your glory through me. I was just, I was reading a book this week for our boys. Um, it's a book on prayer. It's like it's a little kid's book. Um, that's a good book. Like it teaches them like you can pray anytime. Like God loves to hear your prayer when you're scared or when you're anxious or when you mess up, like God's happy to, God wants to hear you praying. But I thought it was interesting. I got to the end of the book with my boys, and I realized, like, that's, they didn't mention Jesus at all. Like, it's a book designed for Christians about how to pray, and it didn't mention, like, a part of the main reason we can pray is because of Jesus. <laughs> and we're going to still keep using the book, so don't hear me. Like, I'm not, like, out in the back, like, burning this book. Heresy! You know, I'm not saying... <laughs> I'm just saying, the main point of how we enjoy God and come to know him and walk with him is through Jesus. Like the purpose of Jesus coming is so that we can see the size, the value, and beauty, the glory of God and say, this is where my life's identity rests and lives and works out of. Right, it's, um, I've had family come and visit uh, church services here and other places and the regular comment is, man, you guys... You guys talk a lot about Jesus. <laughs> I want us to be people that know that are known. Hey, you guys talk a lot about Jesus. Not that, not whatever political position you're talking about. Not how um, you know how bad uh, other groups of people are, uh, or how great the Patriots are. I mean, even though the Patriots are great, we want to be known <laughs> for talking a lot about Jesus. And that's what Jesus is praying here. So the thing, he's talking about the grand stage of your life, your purpose is all about the glory of God. The second thing we're going to pick up here, verse 13, God's glory and your story. So verse 13, let me read verse 13 through verse 19. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I did not ask that you take them out of the world, but you kept them, you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for, them, for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. All right, so the, when Jesus says, verse 13, but I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world, the things that he's probably talking about in that moment is the things that he's just talking about like that night. So that for chapter thir uh, verse thir 
chapter 13 through chapter 17. These things, those are probably the immediate things he's talking about, but it probably includes not just the immediate things he's talking about, it probably includes all the sayings that Jesus has been saying all through the book of John, right? He says, I have spoken them, I have spoken these things in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. He said, right, the, the seven I am statements of John, right? I am the bread of life. People who are hungry and tired of the world and all the maggot-filled bread that the world gives us for our identity. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the one that satisfies us. I'm the light of the world. People who are just follow, following, groping around in the darkness of our own ideas of what's best for our lives, how to make our, our lives work, trying to do life on our own. Jesus is the light who comes in and shows us where and how we are to live and to, and to give our eyes sight to see. He's the door of the sheep. He's how we come in to be God's people. He's the good shepherd. He's not only how we come in to be God's people, but he's actually how we walk with God. He's the one who cares for us and guides us. And a shepherd, what does a shepherd do? He carries the weak sheep, which is the reality. We're all weak sheep who need him to carry us. He's the one who carries us. Or he's the resurrection and the life. When we stare down, as Claudette is staring down, the death of you know dying at this very moment. We all, I mean, the reality is we could all die on our way home, right? <laughs> Jesus is the one who says, because I... I have risen from the dead and have conquered death. We sing the song, death was arrested. Jesus is the one that res- promises to resurrect us and give us new life, not only in our souls, but in our bodies. He is the way, the truth, and the life. With Jesus, there is all wisdom for all of life. He is the true vine. He is the one. Jesus alone is the one who nourishes us. And what's interesting, if you don't have to flip there, but John 15, 1, where he says, I am the true vine and the father is the fine vine dresser. At the end of that paragraph, what does he say? These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. So that when he prays, <laughs> right, verse 13 in, John, in chapter 17, I speak these things in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus is speaking his word into our lives so that we get his joy, right? The way he transfers his joy in knowing and seeing God for who he is into our souls as he reveals who God is by his word into our lives, right? He says, this is what I am. I want you to be happy, right? (laughs) I think that's incredible, incredible that what Jesus says here, he says, you know what? This is not just some sort of textbook, for understanding kind of like all these true things about God. This book is a way of, is the way of God speaking into our souls to light us with joy. He wants us to be happy. Like, isn't that incredible? Like God does not just want servile people walking around with, you know, with whips kind of throwing them, you know, lashing, oh, we're so horrible. (laughs) He wants us to see him and have our, his joy fulfilled in us. Which kind of leads me into verse 14 to 19. The thing that's interesting here is he says, I've given them your word. I'm, I've spoken everything that you want me to say to them, right? I've spoken everything about who I am and who you are. But I think it's interesting, verse 15. I did not ask that you had take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Which is kind of interesting, right? It's kind of interesting kind of point to say, here's Jesus saying, look, I want them to be happy. I'm giving them your word. But here's, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. Sometimes we talk about, talk about the world like, um, some Christian circles will talk about the world like it's an incredibly evil and wicked place and that everything that's material is bad, right? All the desires that you have, uh, all the, the world is just really bad and that you should really just basically read your Bible all the time at home and never go out into the world because it's a dirty, nasty place. But Jesus, doesn't, he doesn't, pray, what he prays not that we would be taken out of the world, but that we would be protected from the evil one because Jesus owns the world, right? A part of the glory of God and the way he's designed the world, he's designed the world to show his glory. It belongs to Jesus. The world radiates with the glory of God. 
It shows us who God is. It tells us who God is. It tells us how great and glorious the size of value and beauty. The world is designed that way, right? So all the great food that we eat, <laughs> all the great drinks that we make, all the great music that's made, it's all designed in one way or another to tell us our God is incredibly creative, incredibly imaginative, and he wants his glory seen and enjoyed in the full range of the world, right? My uncle... Um, I was with my uncle this summer because we were at my brother's wedding, and my uncle's a chemist. Um, and the most chemistry that I do is uh, bubble baths, right? <laughs> like I'm not like I'm not a chemist, <laughs> but my uncle is. And he's like a cra- he's like one of those like crazy like um, I think he got his PhD studying boron. Like it's on the periodic table somewhere. Yeah, it sounds boron to me too. <laughs> it's, he got he's like wicked smart, um, but he's also a Christian. But he was telling me about like. He's doing some work now on agitated protons, which I didn't know was, I didn't know you could agitate protons. <laughs> but if they do something with energy transfer and it kind of like is really important. But we were talking about chemistry stuff. Um, it was mostly me just saying like, oh, so tell me more about that. Like, I don't know any questions to ask about chemistry, you know. But he was saying about, look, the more you, you delve down into the way all this chemistry stuff interacts, you begin to see how just exaggeratedly creative God is in revealing who he is. Like, have you ever thought about this? I mean, God did not have to go out of his way to be so lavish with being a show-off, right? But God shows off how great he is by just how incredible the universe and the world we live in is, right? From the top of, the, of Mount Everest to the depths of the Mariana Trench, it all is revealing the glory of God. He is excessive, with how great he is because God is so great and when he starts showing off, it's all gonna be good for us to enjoy, right? He, he creates a world that is intended to show us how amazing he is, right? Psalm, Psalm 19, verse one, right? The heavens declare the glory of the Lord, right? You know that, that Psalm? The world is incredibly chatty about telling how great God is. And when Jesus prays his prayer, he has in mind this reality that he owns all of it and he intends for us to enjoy him in the midst of it, right? Abraham Kuyper, a Dutch guy from the last century, he has this great line where he says, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. Jesus owns it all. And so when Jesus prays his prayer, he's not praying, I want you guys to get uh, eject out of the world. What he's saying is, I want my word to come in and open your eyes to see and to enjoy me and be protected in my world, right? So that's why he goes on to pray, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth, right? So here we have, we've been talking about the five solas, scripture alone. Scripture is how God it is, it is God's scalpel for not only cutting out the sins of our lives, but it's also the way in which he refines and shapes us into the image of Christ. Right, this is what Jesus is saying is, your story, sanctifying means uh, the, long, the long road of becoming like Jesus. That's your story. It says, your story is under the sovereign control of Jesus. And it is intended to show his glory. It is intended to reveal who he is. Right, we, uh, your story will never work out if you are trying to make it be all about you. It will all be all about you in the end. It will be incredibly tiny. But the route is our lives don't really go the way we plan, do they? <laughs> we we plan to become, plan different dynamics. We plan lives uh, for different reasons, different aspirations, you know, whether that's business or family or marriage or church or politics or just money or whatever it is. Our plans don't really plan out the way they do. We plan them to, do they? But Jesus says, your story is not about getting those things or achieving those things. Your story, amidst all the dreams that you've had, the regrets that happen, your story is more about God's glory 
when we get that, I think um, our desire for jobs, our desire for spouses, our desire um, for success, they, they begin to kind of get tamped down. Not that we don't want those things, right? But they actually become servants to the story that Jesus is weaving in our souls to become more like him become more at peace with what he's doing in our lives, trusting that he is the one in control. Right? We're not the one trying to call the shots. And you know, it's okay that I live in Manchester, New Hampshire, or Derry, New Hampshire, or anywhere else in New Hampshire that's not exactly like, you know, like on the top, like the, like the most incredible places in the world to live. But this is God's story. I get to be here, and he's the one writing it for me. Right? Don't hear what I'm not saying, right? I love New Hampshire. I think it's the best place in the world. The fact that it has Shire in it, even better, right? But I'm just saying, like, this is like God's story for you is that we become more like him, not that we get all the success and all the gifts and all the blessings. We get, we get to become more like Jesus. It's incredible. I think it should give an incredible amount of peace to us that we, we become more like him because we often think about God. I don't know if you think about if you... Uh, experiences, but right, the Christian life often kind of goes like this. Um, yes, Jesus has saved me. Yes, God has been good to me. And about two weeks into your Christian life, you realize I am a scumbag and a dirt bag, and I don't know anything about what to do about anything. I'm a horrible, rotten person, and I can't believe that God loves me. Right? That's usually the way it goes, right? Yes, Jesus is great. Oh, this Christian life is hard because now the Holy Spirit's beginning to show me things about my life, show me who I am. Right, we often want to think about God as like this doting grandfather, right? Kind of like, here's just more grace, more grace, more grace. You're okay. Yes, God gives us grace, but it's kind of like um, God moves into our house. Like if you think of your soul as like a house, God moves into the house, and we think of it as like, well, God's going to do a little bit of some renovation, so we're going to get rid of the old furniture, we're going to get Ikea furniture, we're going to kind of re- redo this, refurbish a little bit. And then God starts, what happens is God starts busting down walls and opening up closets with dead skeletons in them and starts adding on aspects and hallways and digging out the basement. He starts doing some major reconstruction work on our souls. That's to sanctify them in your truth because God is after changing us to be more like Jesus because our story is becoming more about him rather than realizing our own desires. But look with me there at verse 17 through 19. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me in the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Have you ever thought about this? Right now, Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is, he thinks about you. Thinks about the folks at King's Cross Church. He prays for you right now. That's what he's saying when he says, I consecrate myself, right? God, I'm giving myself over to this mission for them to become more like you. For for your glory to be seen and felt and enjoyed, I'm giving myself to that. Jesus, Jesus knows all the ways in which you're struggling right now. The week, how hard the week is, how frustrating it is, the things that are not going well, the things that are not being realized, all the regrets and failures of your life, the things that are going well, the blessings, He knows all those things. And he's praying that in the midst of those things, your soul will be satisfied with Jesus. He's praying for you right now. So let's pick up and we'll we'll end with this. God's glory and your future. Verse 24 to 26. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Right. Did you have any, any big plans for your life when you were a kid? <laughs> when I was a kid, I wanted to become an astronomer. Um, I loved astronomy. My boys love astronomy. I wanted to become an astronomer until I took physics in high school, and I realized that astronomy required math, and that's when I was like, nah, not my thing. 
Michelle wanted to become a constitutional lawyer, and then she met me, and she was like, well, I'll stick with him. The Constitution can take care of itself. <laughs> Do you have any big plans for what you wanted to be? Right? It doesn't matter exactly what those were. Right? Whatever those were, Jesus is rewriting your story to satisfy with what you, what you want, with what, what he wants for you in his life. But his main, his main end game for you, what does Jesus want? What is his big dream for you? Verse 14, or 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, not just to be with them, to be in the same area, the same state. What's this end of the sentence? To see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world, right? Your story, whatever, your story starts with Jesus. He saves you. The middle, I don't know what's going to happen in the middle between now and death. Jesus is going to be with you. But the end game, that where Jesus wants you to be, where Jesus, his big dream for your life that's going to happen, I want them to see me, to see and enjoy who I am, to see me in all of all that I am and all of who I am, of all that's great about me, right? He wants us to see him, right? The, the story of our lives right now, right? You know what this device is designed to do? <laughs> it's designed to make the world all about me, right? It's all about me. I can Instagram about all that I'm doing, all the great things that's going on in my life. I can tweet about all my random thoughts and how great they are. I can check emails because people desire to have my attention. I can check news that's specifically curated for everything that I want to know about and not the things I don't want to know about. I can have apps that track all of my health data because I am so incredibly important that I need to have all my data recorded for the rest of time. Right? This device is designed to suck you in to making your life the main focus of your, of your desires. Right? We live in a world that is all about how can you become great. Right? And I'm not saying the phone, you should chuck your phone. Obviously, I'm using my phone. But there's where we live and we have these internal desires. I want to become great and I want other people to see and know. I want other people to know how great I am. Right, but Jesus' main desire is that you would see his glory, see how, how great he is, how patient and kind he is, how good he is. He wants us to enjoy him and to see him face to face. The, glory, the road to seeing him is started by enjoying him now. Right? You won't see Jesus face to face and enjoy him then if you don't enjoy him now. But he has designed your life and he has designed the world so that right now his main prayer for you is so that when you die, you will see him face to face. And you know what Jesus will say to you when you see him face to face? Say, I always knew that you could be this happy. He will look at you face to face. He will say, I always knew. I knew in all the darkness and sin of your life I knew in all the ways in which you'd rejected me. I knew in all the ways in which you needed me to come and save you. I knew that you could be this happy. When we see him, when we see all that he is, we see him face to face. Right, so here we've seen, through these five solas, we've seen God's word. We actually see him right in this passage, right? God's word is the way in which God speaks authoritatively in our lives and sanctifies us. The way in which we come to God is because his grace reaches out and grabs us out of death to bring us into life. He gives us faith, not because our faith is so great, but because our faith reaches out and clings unto Jesus, who is so great. And Jesus is the one who prays for us to be able to see and to enjoy and put our lives in perspective of God's glory. That God is the one, God is the one who needs to be seen and enjoyed. Right, the size, the grandeur of God the value, how good he is to us, and the beauty, that he would design this story so that we're satisfied. We're satisfied with Jesus. Right, we are created to enjoy the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you have saved us in Jesus to be satisfied with him. We pray that right now as we turn to your meal that we would 
be freshly reminded of the grace you've given us in Jesus to delight in him and to enjoy him. So it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from King's Cross Church in Manchester, New Hampshire. Please feel free to share or distribute this content, but do not charge for it or alter the content in any way without permission. King's Cross Church exists to treasure, proclaim, and grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out more about King's Cross Church, please visit us at kingscrossmanchester.com.